speak less and Dr. Fauci began to speak more. And then we found that the message was moving from flattening the curve to everyone needs to wear a mask to everyone needs to work from home to children can get, need to go to virtual school and not have in-person class uh, teaching and learning to closing down businesses. And the mess just got worse and worse and worse. It just Welcome to the Janelle King Show. I am Janelle King, and this is Extra 106.3. And this is where we discuss kitchen table topics that are typically banned from family gatherings, but are absolutely necessary in order to have a strong republic. So what's happened so far? There's a lot that's been going on, particularly in politics, in the media. And um, there's some things that I've noticed, some stuff that I've been watching, and I want to talk about it a little bit. So let's just start with the fact that President Trump has already been convicted. We all saw that. Whether you agree or disagree, hey. That's your prerogative. Um, we're not going to talk about that. However, what we are going to talk about is the fact that we have Trump getting convicted. We have Biden on trial and what this means for the 2024 election cycle. Um, so a recent poll was revealed that, you know, when you, that showed that when you throw Chase Oliver, our libertarian in the race, when you throw RFK, our independent in the race and Cornell West, I think he's part of the Green Party. We're going to say, but when you throw all of them in the race, this recent poll revealed that um, post the conviction of President Trump, that right now they are tied at 45 percent. So Biden and Trump are both sitting at 45 percent. Now, I want to make sure I am accurate with these notes. So here are my we're accurate with this, these data points. So I have my notes in front of me. OK. Considering that most of these candidates are on the ballot in Georgia, if the election was held today, there would be a runoff here in Georgia. Why am I saying that? It's because in Georgia, you have to get 50 plus one extra vote. So 50 plus one uh, percent in order to uh, win outright. Otherwise, you're going into a runoff. So as of today, we will be looking at a runoff, and that's pretty interesting. So what does this really mean? In my opinion, it means that independent voters will decide who will take the White House. It also means that independent voters will be creating the direction of where things are going to go, particularly giving us a glimpse as to what midterms will look like. And what do I mean by independent voter? That's always been a little tricky because I've met people who have said that they're independents or that they vote independent, but uh, they typically vote either one side or the other. Um, they either vote heavily on the Democrat side or heavily on the Republican side. So I'm not talking about the people who claim to be independent, but they're voting in the same direction majority of the time. These are voters who typically flip back and forth because they tend to vote based on their needs and concerns at that particular moment. They are they're 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 not the uh, single issue voters. They're not the ones who are like, I'm going to vote Democrat every single time because I'm pro choice or I'm going to vote Republican every single time because I'm pro life. That's not who these people are. They care about protecting the masses, but not in a way where a lot of these other voters who are single issue voters or who are partisan voters care about it. A lot of partisan voters, whether you're part of the, the Republican Party, where you feel like the economy is such a major issue and financial issues is such a major issue and that it impacts the masses on a grand, grand scale. So you typically vote that party because you know that's something that's going to impact all of us or vice versa. There are Democrats who feel like a lot of these social issues are something that's going to impact us on a, a mass scale. So as a, as a whole, as a society. And so they vote in that direction. Either way, both of those can be a little tricky. So I personally feel like independents are individuals who do care about the masses, but they often feel that their protection of the mass or of, of, of our society as a whole is voting on current issues. Whatever is happening in society that day, that's what we need to be focusing in on. And that's where we need to be um, putting a lot of our energy and a lot of our time. So independents, in my opinion, sound much like this. Hey guys, unfortunately, due to copyright laws, I cannot play the video. However, I have added the link to the description box so you can check that out on your free time. Now back to the show. So 
how do our candidates each see these voters, right? Like, how do you reach these voters? How do you see them? How do you identify them? That is extremely hard. Independent, true independent voters, which I have a few friends that are true independents. And I enjoy talking to them because they give me insight that I hadn't had or they allow me to think about things from a different perspective. So what is the message? Like, What can the message be that as it relates to going into 2024 election? And, um, you know, how can you message to these independent voters? Well, it's no secret to any of us, uh, shouldn't be a secret, that I am a Republican. And as a Republican, I'm going to share how I believe Trump can message to independents. And quite frankly, um, how I believe that he already has the quote unquote ammunition to do this. I believe that he has what it takes to really go in there and win uh, independent voters, probably more so than President Biden, because I don't think President Biden can uh, lean into some of this stuff that I'm going to talk about as easy as President Trump. Okay, so a Fox News poll revealed that 18% of independent voters said the verdict, the conviction that was that was made, uh, that they are that made them less likely. So that 18% says they are less likely to vote for the president due to this this um, whole uh, conviction that just took place. 49% at some point felt that he should drop out of this race altogether um, post the conviction. Now, I'm not sure if I believe 100% that 49%. I don't think it's that much and it feels a little manipulated, which you can do when it comes to polling, but that's another conversation that we'll do another time. Either way, I do believe that there are several independent voters who do feel that way. And I think it's more in that 18%. So I'm going to say about 20% of our independent voters are either questioning or willing to go in a different direction than support Republicans. But before we discuss how to win these voters, we have to start with how we got here. Like what was the catalyst that kind of drew us into this point, right? Or got us to this position. In 2016, I did not vote for President Trump in the primary. Um, I voted for Marco Rubio in the primary, which is so funny looking back at it, but that's who I voted for, okay? I was a little younger, whatever. And I'm okay with Rubio. Rubio. I'm not, this is no shade on Rubio. However, I probably would have done a little bit differently <laughs> going forward, uh, but hindsight's 2020 is what they say, or some people say hindsight is 2015, but that's totally up to you. Either way, I totally supported him in the general election, and um, so did 48% of independent voters. So keep that number in your mind. So 48% of independent voters also supported President Trump in uh, 2016 during his presidential race. We believed, we all believed that we needed a break from political dynasties, right? You know what I mean? Like the Bush family, the Clintons, like we didn't want to keep seeing family members continuing to run because we don't live in a monarchy. We don't like family involvement in politics and particularly for it to last more than a convenient amount of time. Um, so if you're past more than two generations, we prefer not to see it at all, but we might give it a pass because we have um, for two generations, right? Like we saw with the Bush family. However, America is not a monarchy. And so there's no instances where we wish to have a monarchy present. So the option to choose from an outsider um, or choose a... Thank you so much for joining the show. Please remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit that notification bell so you'll be notified every time I upload new content. Now back to the discussion. Is this man? That was something that was really, really intriguing to a lot of voters, including myself, um, when it came to voting in the 2016 election cycle. And not only because, you know, we were Republican, <laughs> that's another angle, another perspective that, that we are, you know, there. So I definitely think that that's really, really important to, to note and to pay attention to. Um, is whether or not there is a aspect, I should say, of this that is um, really going to push us forward in an aspect of whether or not we should talk about if families should move forward, if families should continue on to do things. Don't know. We're not going to, you know, anyway, that's a whole other conversation, a whole other situation. Okay. So that being said, 
where, where was I? Let's get back. Okay. So that being said, there were people who wanted this outsider that wanted a businessman who wasn't afraid to speak their mind. And I think that that's something that we have to continue to focus in on because he seemed at that moment, like the best alternative. That's what people wanted. It worked. And Trump won that election. Democrats had a meltdown. But a lot of Republicans were rejoicing because we felt like, all right, we stopped this monarchy of a situation that was coming our way. And we decided that we were able to kind of control it a little bit more, a little bit better. All right. So Trump, he did a great job when it comes to the, came to the economy. He did a great job when it came to stabilizing the economy. Um, jobs were in abundance. Everyone, particularly um, people who were unemployed are now working. So everyone's working, which caused the economy to be highly stimulated. And that led to competitive salaries. And in other words, we were winning. We were winning strong. So when 2020 came around, um, uh, it was a no-brainer that people wanted to support the president once again. That was something that we saw happening very early on. But then something major happened in 2020. COVID. <laughs> COVID hit the scene. And when COVID hit the scene, the next thing you knew, you had Dr. Fauci running America. At least that's what it felt like to me with Dr. Burks waiting in the wing beside him. So Trump, in an attempt to be transparent during this time, he hosted a daily press conference. And this press conference is where he began to speak less and Dr. Fauci began to speak more. And then we found that the message was moving from flattening the curve to everyone needs to wear a mask to everyone needs to work from home to children can get, need to go to virtual school and not have in-person class uh, teaching and learning to closing down businesses. And the mess just got worse and worse and worse. It just grew and grew and grew to the point where our economy was just like on the verge of collapse. It got really bad. That then created this conversation around whether or not um, tr uh, President Trump would be the best for this job, right? People started really talking about how COVID was handled. And then all of a sudden, due to Operation Warp Speed, we now have a vaccine that was ready to go and ready to be put in arms in under a year. Okay, this is not about the vaccine, so we're not going to talk about that. However, I'm going to let that go for now. We may come back to that. However, the handling of COVID, the handling of George Floyd and the riots, all of that stuff was what I believe began to start the questioning around whether or not President Trump can be that. And in my opinion, my opinion, I believe that some paranoia slipped in with the president as well, which then led to um, a situation where much like Nixon, I hate to say it, but much like Nixon, we can talk about that later. Um, he began to be a little bit skeptical and just really concerned about everything that was happening around him. All right. Next thing you know, the support started to shift a little bit and there became unrest, became a focal point, uh, debates around whether or not to trust the science or not trust the science, or if we are trusting the science and if the science is really the science and all this other stuff. Right. And it just wasn't, it, it just wasn't mathing. Okay. Everything was a little weird. People were questioning stuff. And it was it created this huge divide, not only on the racial side because of the riots, but also when it comes to medical and medicine and big pharma and all of this stuff, all these conversations started happening. Long story short, President Trump lost in 2020. And he went from having 48% of independent voters to 41% of independent voters, which is just 7%, 7 percentage points. However, it put him in the strike zone. In the political world, strike zone means that this is where if we hit you at the right moment, we hit you with the right thing, we might be able to knock you out. So he was in um, strike zone after all of this, which was accompanied by Trump losing male white voters. Um, and suburban women. That was something that we also saw decrease in 2020 as well. And um, much like what we're seeing now with minority voters, he did get a little bit of an uptick in, in minority voters. So that's something that's interesting to watch as well. But all of it has to come together and work together in order for it to lead to a win. Now, there's the question of voter fraud. Obviously, that is still being heavily debated. And it, and I am not going to address that in this in this video, however, or this uh, interview, but I will say that 
overall, that is the topic too, that you know you can't leave it out because it's still being addressed. Either way you look at it, Biden's in the White House, Trump is not. So Biden became president and that's where we are. Fast forward to today, and we have seen that there's been a more defined Trump base that is very different from the traditional Republicans that we have seen in the past and the traditional Republican base. It's very different. And unfortunately, or fortunately, Biden has that same challenge. Like he has that same issue as well with his base because it's not the traditional Democrats that we've known in the past. It's not the Kennedy Democrats, obviously, but it is um, more of this progressive movement that he is um, being surrounded by that's really dictating and driving the conversation. And there's also a lot more independence. So that's where we're going to hang out today. There are a lot of independents who feel that they don't fit in either one of those boxes. They don't think that they are far right or far left or even close to it. So they are standing directly in the middle of the line. These people are also people who feel like they can't identify with a party. They feel like they just don't, they don't understand it at all. So it appears that it's coming down to this one voter group that is on, that is the hardest to predict that's going to decide our election cycle. How do you reach independent voters? Particularly now, particularly in this climate. What is the most, um, what is the thing that we can do that will grab their attention, right? Now, keeping in mind that this, this group of voters are the most unpredictable, like they are really hard to predict. And I started by um, this, this, I started this um, episode by discussing or showing a small clip of uh, Bertie Wise, who is a woman who was giving a speech, a TED talk, and she listed off how, what she believes. And it really shows you how you can go back and forth because you're independent. They are very, very, very unpredictable. Okay. The first thing that I think will help uh, President Trump win independent voters is to start by being wrong at least once. What do I mean by that? <laughs> In Trump's response, Trump's response to every single attack that comes is the same every single time. I've done nothing wrong. Everything is great. I've done nothing wrong. Okay. That is his strategy and I get it. But here's the thing, 54% of Americans think that you did do something wrong. According to the recent poll, 54% of Americans think that you did do something wrong in that recent conviction. What was it? I don't know. While this isn't impacting the overall polls as it relates to whether or not people will vote for him or any of that stuff, being seen as trustworthy is a key element to winning, winning independent voters. And it includes being able to uh, separate fact from fiction, right? Trying to separate what is true, what really happened from what they are trying to over-exaggerate or what they are trying to drive as a major issue, but it really isn't. It's possible to do something wrong that's not criminal, but perhaps morally wrong, right? In other, in other words, yes, I did sleep with her, if that's what he did, allegedly. But yes, I did sleep with Stormy Daniels. However, what I didn't do is what you're accusing me of, that you're saying is criminal. That right there is a message that I think independents can say, okay, I could kind of get behind that, right? But when you say, I'm not doing, I've never done anything else, I've never seen her, I don't know who she is, and all this other stuff, and we kind of know what you do, that's when it gets a little weird. So it's being, it's it's not about being right all the time. It's about being honest, right? And in being honest, there are times when you might have to admit that something you did was not the best decision, but it wasn't criminal. So there you go. Admitting it actually humanizes you. It humanizes you and it makes you more of a person that people feel like they can trust. And that is something that is very, very necessary because the voter base, what I've seen over my decade long and plus years of working in politics is that the voter base is very forgiven, mostly because we've all have things that we are like, uh, probably shouldn't have done that. You know, I wish I could take it back, but I can't. So, oh, well, that's something that you have to keep in mind. I think he should start by acknowledging that there's no one side that has all the answers. Like there's no one side that is always right, that can never, that, that, that never does anything wrong, like that has every answer. Independents know this to be true. And the reason why independents know this to be true is because there are things 
that they can get behind on both sides of the aisle. And appearing to be too partisan as a leader is a sure way to turn off independence. And this leads me into my next point. A way to create a connection is by highlighting areas of commonality, right? Highlighting those areas where we do have some things that we agree with, we do have some things that we can work together on. For example, an area where I can totally support progressives is when they're fighting for clean food, clean air, and clean water. There are tons of research that's being done, environmental studies, and progressive-led causes that has led to an increased education around what we are allowing in our bodies, either through what we're eating, what we are inhaling, or what we're drinking. Like there's so much research that's being done and I am not against it. I do think that this is something we need to pay attention to. As innovation continues to grow, as we continue to be an innovative society, which is what America is known for, we're also going to see that there are ways in which we've decided to fight poverty and we've decided to fight um, starvation that gets increasingly more creative. And that creativity often leads to an increased use of chemicals or synthetics and things that are just god awful for the environment, but not just for the environment, but for our personal health. Like there are things that are happening that is really a problem, right? Heavy metals being found inside of us. I mean, there's just so many things that we have to pay attention to. So fighting and pushing back on that is not a bad thing. I'm actually extremely grateful that there are people who are putting in the work, putting in the energy to do that. I think it's so, so important. However, President Trump, and this is one of those things where I said that he may have some ammunition in his back pocket that he can pull out. I believe that President Trump can't, has a personal connection to this. Well, not I believe, I know he does. He has a personal connection to this. And I think that the supporting of environmental causes should be on display in 2024 because it's something that's really, really important to not just independent voters, but to some Democrats that may be looking to support someone else. So that's one way that I think he can really connect with them. Now, what is that personal connection that he has? Well, Jared Kushner, who is his son-in-law, he's married to Ivanka, his investment firm, Affinity Partners, has invested over $100 million uh, to a solar finance company called Mosaic, okay? So Mosaic is a solar finance company that provides loans for solar energy installations and other sustainable home improvements. They aim to make solar power more accessible and more affordable for homeowners. And they do this by offering financial solutions that enables the installation of the solar panels and other energy efficient upgrades. So this is a company, Mosaic, that Jared Kushner decided to invest $100 million into, okay? So his investment was a huge sign that he obviously supports these causes or sees that these causes and these issues are going to be something that's going to be extremely profitable in the future. So it's not going anywhere. Despite what people say, despite the fact that there's a large um, a group of the of the Republican base that is completely against any of this stuff. Doesn't matter. Jared understands. He reading the tea leaves. He sees that it's going in that direction, and he he invested in it. I think that is something that um, by using this as talking points, I think in and openly talking about this, I think it will lead to helping to clear up this misguided narrative that Republicans don't care about the environment. It's so, it cannot be any further from the truth. It just cannot be any further from the truth. The number of Republicans I know who are farmers, who are cattlemen, who have personal farms, who will live off the land, it is just astounding. So a lot of Republicans care about the environment. Why? Because we treat our animals like our family. You know, a lot of these cattlemen, their cows and their um, they're the calves and the bulls, they are family to them. So why would you why would you care about if the water's clean, if the food the, if our food is clean, or if our uh, air is clean? Because many of these cattlemen have grass fed animals, grass fed cows. So that being said, they're also drinking um, in the creeks, in the creek water on their land. So this is something that is extremely important. Clean air and clean water is a must for their industry, 
for their animals and all of the above. Okay, that leads me to another way that Trump can reach out to independent voters. It's by calling out the fringe crazies that do exist. Not everyone in every party is a crazy because they are more fringe, but there are some that are. And sometimes you need to call it out, especially when they say crazy things that miseducate the public or that creates this just wild discussion that doesn't need to go anywhere and shouldn't even be talked about in the first place. Prime example, calling Michelle Obama a man. Whether you agree or not doesn't matter. It does not matter. It's inappropriate, but at best it's unnecessary. It's extremely unnecessary. It is distracting. It's, it's allowing people to talk about things when they can be talking about stuff that's extremely important, stuff that will actually win over independent voters and win over people who are questioning whether or not they want to vote in either side that they've typically voted in. This is something that he can do immediately. Let's stop with all the distracting and let's get focused. Ending these discussions when when they begin is imperative. The moment it comes up, saying something like, oh, nope, I'm not going to support that. We need to move on. We're not talking about that. And being the leader that you are is a, will go a long way with winning independent voters. It will not take as long as you may think. So that's something that I really think we need to pay attention to and we need to be focused in on is being able to uh, focus in on your base and correct them when they're wrong. You have to remember that most independents simply want the government to govern. And that's it. That's it. We don't want you to be the moral police. They don't want you to be a bully. Many independents um, care, particularly those in that base, care about you focusing in on doing what the government is supposed to do and not creating all of this attention, all this focus on stuff that doesn't really matter. So keep that in mind and pay attention to that. Here's another thing. Many of the independent base care about local presence. They, like, they care about how you... Thank you so much for joining the show. Please remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit that notification bell so you'll be notified every time I upload new content. Now back to the discussion. As a candidate, um, how you show up locally, how are you received and perceived locally? And as a presidential candidate, this is extremely hard to do because you have to be present in every single state, which is virtually impossible. It's actually like physically impossible too, when it comes to um, being a, a presidential candidate because you just can't do it. So you have to rely heavily on your base. You have to rely heavily on the base to be some form or some sort of a representative of your campaign. And it's really hard to do that when your base is angry, when they're mean, when they're insulting, when they're hard to receive. It is extremely hard for, for the base to get an idea of who you are as a candidate when you have these type of uh, behavior, this type of behavior or these type of actions taking place in the community. Who would want to stand with them or more importantly, be seen as one of them if they are acting like that? All right. Another strategy that has been discussed, but I also support it because it is something that I think needs to happen and needs to happen quickly. He needs to reach out to Nikki Haley and all the other candidates and the people who had a huge independent following. These are the voters who did not support him in the primary. These are voters who are just kind of over him. These individuals, these candidates that had that support, you need to reach out to them. And you need to get, excuse me, get them involved. They need to be a part of this discussion 100%. Um, for one, it shows that there is unity despite all the personal attacks and all the other stuff. It shows that you can create some form of unity. And I do think that by picking a VP candidate who will lead the charge on this matter is extremely important as well. I think it would help um, the initiative, but it's going to require courage. And I do believe that many of the base um, will have an issue if he was to pick a Nikki Haley as a VP. But who cares? Because we'll, we'll get into that later. We'll get into that later. But who cares? <laughs> um, what you don't want is um, you, you, you want independents to feel like they are represented, right? Because independents do exist. They are 
very much so paying attention to this and her independence um, will will support if they know that she's there helping to guide as well and guide the White House. And here's the thing. The reason why I said does it matter what the base thinks? Because what matters as a leader is that the truth comes out, that the truth is always better than anything else. That's what leaders do. So that being said, and we're going to talk a little bit more later on about that too. But that being said, I also think, and lastly, my last uh, strategy or my last point as to how I think President Trump can win over these particular voters, these independent voters, is to let's talk, let, let, let's do, like, let's see, this is getting tricky. It's by talking less about <laughs> I and more about we. We being America, we being everyone. And there are people who feel that he does that, but this is what I believe. I believe that there's already a narrative that's building and that's continuing to grow that's around President Trump being grievance driven. And I think this is like hovering over his head like, like a dark cloud because people are really concerned about that. A lot of independents are really concerned about President Trump getting into the White House and then we, we, we have to now relive all the things that happen to him as he goes after everybody. That is something people are not here for and they don't want to be here for, okay? So speaking to your issues without making your, your issues the focus is what's important. You can mention that these things are happening to me. You can clear things up. But when you make it the single focus of the campaign, it throws other people off because we just don't want it. We all have issues. We all have things that we're going through. They may not be on that, that scale of an issue because most people are not billionaires. However, there are some things that, um, that, that people are going through that seem to take precedent in their life more so than what President Trump is going through. So they don't want to sit there and hear about your problems over and over and over again. Personally, I believe that it's more of a winning strategy when trying to win over these independent voters. Whenever you can see what is happening and by telling us that you are fighting for us is one thing, but asking us to help you fight for your personal battles is a whole other thing. Nobody wants to do that. So I do think the winning strategy when it comes to independence as it relates to your messaging, it does have to include everyone. It has to be America focused. Go back to speaking about the greatness of America, about how capitalism is a system of freedom and not a ball and chain that we've seen when there isn't when it isn't present in other countries. Let's talk about how the constitution should be upheld and why. Let's talk about things that make people excited about your campaign and less feeling like they have to be an activist or some type of defender of you and your campaign. When people feel like they have to do all of that, mm -mm, they're going to move forward. They're going to find somebody else that makes them feel like they don't have to be worried about you and themselves. Okay. Most people don't have time and don't want it. All of this advice is made possible. I mean, it's made possible with courage. You cannot do any of these things if you don't have courage. And this goes back to what I was saying about being able to speak to your base, because that also requires a lot of courage. Courage is the missing ingredient, I believe, in society today, because it often means that you will have to go against the grain. Every tip that I just displayed will cause you to have to go against the grain. You're going, they're going to be a group of people, particularly in your own party, that's going to have an issue with what you have to say. But that doesn't mean that that should really matter. At the end of the day, you need to do what is the right thing to do. And you need to do the thing that's going to support the majority of the people that you will be representing and serving and not just the small portion of your base. But I want to close by saying that I think it's important as a leader to push past the base. I think it's important to just lead, right? It's good to have a base, but the base is a little fickled, right? They'll get upset about one thing, they'll love another thing, and it's great. I'm a part of a base. I'm, we all are. However, 
I don't want my leader to only listen to me because if that's what you want, then you want a dictator. You want a monarch. You don't want a, um, a, a, a republic or someone who can lead a republic. That's not what you're looking for. So it's important that they can that leaders know how to push past their base because they have more information and they can make certain decisions. Leadership, in my opinion, cannot be done effectively if you are attracted or attached to one side of the argument and you're not examining all sides. I feel like as a leader, it is your job to examine all sides of every argument to make the best decision. It reminds me of a story in the Bible with Solomon, who there was two women that had a baby. Both of their babies were sleeping with them. Apparently one baby died and the woman whose baby died, um, she saw that the other woman was asleep. So she took her baby and, and as hers and replaced it with the dead baby. Well, when the woman woke up that had the live baby, she then had this other woman's dead baby. And she's like, what do I do about this? This is not my child. I guess she just felt like this was not my child. Don't know what's going on. Well, they went before the king. At the time, Solomon was the king. And he suggested something that was extremely unpopular, I am sure. He said, why don't we split the baby in half? And then the whoever, and then that way both of you can have each. <laughs> well, can you imagine the pearls that were grabbed and can you, or clutched, I should say, and can you imagine the gasp that came out of that room? It was probably a bunch of people who thought that was the worst idea ever. But guess what? It turned out to be the right decision because the, the actual mother said, no, 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 she can have the baby. That's how he knew that who the mother was because she would never want anyone to slice her baby in half. So, that was an unpopular opinion, I'm sure. People were thought that that was very bizarre, very weird, very much so against the grain, but true leadership requires courage and he had to have that courage. Courage is something that my husband started talking about when he ran for office in 2021. He ran for US Senate, for those of you who don't know. He was defeated by Herschel Walker in the primary. Um, but some of the things he talked about was courage and having courage and being able to stand up with and do what's right, even when it feels like it's wrong. So I want to leave you with this clip of a TED Talk that I recently found called Courage, the Most Important Virtue by Bari, by Bari Wise. Um, she's also the woman you heard at the beginning of the show. So until next week, I'm going to leave you with this clip and I'm not going to come back afterwards, but I want you to watch this. I want you to be inspired. Until next week, enjoy. Thank you so much for listening. As I stated before, due to copyright laws, I cannot play the video. However, I encourage you to click the link in my bio and listen to the TED Talk that I'm referencing.